Howdy, before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to John Nielsen for explaining to me the way that the SCP rating system actually works, which I thought was based off of how deadly they are, but it's actually based off of how easy they are to can, uh, contain. So, thank you, John, for letting me know that, and now on to the video. Howdy, 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 my name is Anachi Sasuke, and welcome back to Let's Read the SCP Foundation Wiki. In the last episode, we read about the Contingency Plan, which had something to do with atoms. There was also the Like We Were Ever Kindergarten Teachers to start with, which was pretty great. And now we're going to, I believe, look at Deals with the Devil. And then if there's enough time, also what's in the name. But I'm recording this before work, so I don't really have a whole lot of time for this episode, so we'll see how far we get. When the call came, she fig she'd figured it out. She'd figured out enough that she'd been expecting it for a while. There had been an air of distance rather than quiet interference from her superiors, like her actions were being watched. Radio silence. Were they going to ask Dr. Sophia Light about Site 41, her pride and joy buried in the freezing wilderness? About one of her projects? About Airdenet, even. The meeting was arranged in a small, well lit antechamber in the depths of the Salvard site, with Light's assistant Vaux watching and taking notes. The council member, Seven, was a tall woman with deep brown skin and a fishtail braid. She also wore a teal, sk teal skirt suit that looked like it was bought at a value village in the 80s. Light had to adjust her understanding of reality to account for this fact. If she can't wear that, who else can? Thank you for meeting with me, Dr. Light. Likewise, I wouldn't refuse. Seven smiled a lot and it was nothing but teeth. Sounds terrifying. I've come on behalf of the council to ask for your thoughts on some recent matters. You've had a storied career thus far. More objects under your care reclassified as explained than any other research director, if I recall. Not by me directly, but yes, I've I've heard I hold the record. Nobody else really has really focused on that. Haven't you said something to the effect that the ultimate goal of the foundation should be to explain everything? Light grimaced. Not quite. Even I don't believe that every single anomaly has a reasonable explanation. I've just said that while the main priority of researchers is necessarily aiding containment, we also have a responsibility to the Foundation and the world to increase our overall ability to explain reality. Raise the scientific waterline, I suppose. Oh yes, that much less ambitious. Light shrugged. Anomalies are a part of reality. Most research seems to ignore the fact that any effort to make them go away and conform to normal science is fundamentally flawed. The anomalies are already here. Interesting. Several seconds ticked by. Light asked, What did you want my thoughts on? Well, you've seen the documentation. You were around for some of it. What do you think of Mobile Task Force Omega-7? This was not the tax she was expecting. Light considered. Kind of a clusterfuck. It was a bad idea. Extremely. They say hindsight is 20-20. Hindsight bias is a factor, I still wouldn't have planned it that way. What would you have done? Gotten rid of Abel. What else? Seven smiled. Um... Decentralized them. Having to travel as a unit reduced response times. Reduced the burnout rate from training and moved leadership into a hierarchy within the unit. Flexibility is more important than strict order. She paused. She'd never been good at reading people, but saw Valk's service dog bark and jump into his lap reacting to some sign of his anxiety. This alerted Light third hand th that something was wrong. Seven was really smiling. Val, said Light, if you need to leave, go ahead. It's fine, said Val. Keep going, said Seven, excellent points. What do you want? asked Light. Director, we're reopening Pandora's box. A simple, t a similar task force, Alpha 9, last hope. We'd like you to be the director. Permission to get some of whatever command was on when they made that decision. Oh, whatever command was on. That doesn't sound at all controversial. It is. It will be. But it is proceeding. When possible leaders were discussed, your name came up. Time seemed to slow down. Light's eyes went a little distant. She started thinking very, very quickly. Who else? We asked Lament first, another senior operative with an impressive track record. What did he say? He said it was the worst idea he'd ever heard and told Four to fuck off. Light snorted. That's my boy. Who else? After you, we asked Dr. We'd asked Dr. Gears. Past that, we're looking at options. Gears? He would absolutely do it. 
He'd probably do it very well. He'd fulfill High Command's goals precisely. A person like that was dangerous. On the other hand, if the Council didn't have a fourth lined up, they'd be looking at someone less competent. That was very dangerous. Still, I've never led a task force. My plate is full. We expect you to leave your post as site director in any meaningful capacity. We're confident you'll do fine. When you're in a car with no brakes, it doesn't matter how skilled of a driver you are. I don't want to be your figurehead when you crash. We don't intend to crash. We're changing things up. You'll have autonomy, 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 resources, whatever you need. Traditional methods are failing to keep up with the influx of anomalies worldwide. Things are getting worse, Director, and we don't want to lose the progress we've made. The world needs Alpha 9. Excuse me, said Val. He stood up and unsteadily left the room, with Mango in tow. Light looked at Seven. You're serious? As the body's in the wake of a containment breach? Are you my O5? Seven blinked. What? Well, Light, Light searched for the words. I've learned that most senior staff were promoted because, well, because some overseer thought they had potential and followed them along the way. I've never found out who mine was. Oh, no, I'm Kleps. Ah, yours is more handoff. But they're also recommending you for this position. Light considered the evidence, weighed the options. <sighs> I'll take it. Good, Seven nodded. I thought it would take more convincing than that. As you said, I don't want someone less competent t than me in charge of this. Lives are at risk. I think this is a mistake, but I believe I have a track record at averting disaster. Not quite the attitude I was hoping for, but as they say, any port in a storm will be in touch, Director. <laughs> any port in a storm, yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, Light sat down next to Val in the atrium. Wordlessly, Val handed her a cup of coffee. She took a sip. Did that woman really look me in the eyes and say, we're reopening Pandora's box? Yep. <sighs> I don't know how they take themselves seriously. Three days later, the urgent admitted the most urgent administrative duties were reassigned. The suitcases were packed and the office cleared out. One of the more familiar looking student council representatives had been hanging around the uh, Svalbard site and reviewing pre preliminary details. I can't speak at all today about the task force. Seven herself flew off shortly after the meeting. The fluorescent bulb in the meeting room flickered barely perceptibly. Sophia Light tried to ignore it, closed her eyes, she'd be out of here soon enough. Protection, she said. I don't want my name attached anywhere to this. Don't want to be traceable, don't want anyone connecting my file to this in the Foundation or outside it. That's not going to work, Director. Every group of interest out there with a gun is going to be out for blood once this goes live. I NEED protection. protection. You do, agreed the student council representative, but Alpha 9 won't be seen as a hopeful act within the Foundation. People need to know that someone they've heard of and respect is in charge. They do actually have to see you doing it. Fuck. Can you at least keep my name out of it until it goes live? That seems doable. Alright. Guards, then. Well-trained, diverse skill set, highly loyal. Maybe a Pope Mobile? If I have to be a target, I prefer not to be an easy one. I find dying suboptimal, personally. The representative, to their credit, kept a straight face. You will have access to our resources. Guards, absolutely. And anomaly derived personal defenses. I know Command has their own. You're their representative. You probably have them. Well, I want some, too. New designs. I assume you have ideas already. Yes. So did your predecessor. You'll find more in the file. Light frowned, running her fingers over the yellow folder and pe its peeling label. General Bo. Is he my predecessor? Technically? The representative shrugged. Matter of definitions. Symbolically, maybe. With naming the Task Force Alpha rather than Omega, he's not anyone's predecessor. Hmm. Lastly, she thought. She wasn't commonly sentimental, but power is just the ability to make uncommon things happen. I want a layover. They groaned. Right now? Command doesn't like to be kept waiting. The task force has been shelled for over nine for, shelled for nine years. They can wait another six hours. Where? Site 14. Have a, a few last goodbyes before I drop off the radar indefinitely. Hmm. They won't be happy about this. If I had to be happy about everything I did, I'd never get anything done. Work with me here. I'll see what I can do. That all? For now. Thanks, Jay. See you around. She met Val on the surface, waiting with their bags by the runway. He was bundled on a parka and throwing tennis balls for Mango. She warned him the flight had an unexpected layover, told him that he could keep himself busy. Then she fished out her cell phone and dialed an old contact. The other end picked up before the first ring finished. Light drummed her feet on the ground. Hey, Troy and Sophie! Still kicking? Uh, still kicking. You? Yeah, listen, I know it's last minute, but I have a flight that's stopping in 14 for a few hours. 
I wonder if you could free some time up, Mouth Mouth to Mango. Sophie? Yes, that sounds great. Yes, plane's on the way. I can't talk for long. I'll call you once I'm there. Light smiled. You too. She hung up. It's a nice day, said Val. It was as far as days in South Bard, uh, Svalbard go. I don't know how to say that. Chilly, but sun bright on the tundra meadows and rolling rock hills. She supposed she'd add the cold and quiet sight to her list of places to miss. Val was still watching her. What? She asked. Why did you take it? The position, son. It's strange that they offered it to you. They say that in the entire universe, not one unusual thing has ever happened. Light. That's bullshit. Light cracked a grin. Arguably. In this instance, I know that High Command has had some kind of interest in me since very early in my career. Used to think I only got promotions because people thought I was either with the Olympia Project or related to Bright. But that's not true. There's something else. Is this why you're not worried that they're going to shoot us if this plan fails? They'd only shoot me. She sighed. Val... When she offered it, I wasn't sure. Imagine you believe in nuclear power. You can't support it outright because it's politically taboo. For inane bureaucratic reasons. But you've seen that it can supply humanity with cheap energy, pure water, food, health, opportunity. But it's dangerous, ventured Val. Of course it's dangerous. But you strongly suspect it's less dangerous than the alternative. Not using it. You, can, you just can't convince anyone to try it. Then, she continued, imagine the government put you in charge of its nuclear weapons program. Oh. What else could I do? She leaned back, staring out at the tundra. Thou nodded. You sure no one is going to try to kill you? Someone will, almost assuredly, but not command. Like I said, they like me, although I have no idea why. Ah! Above them, a whining engine indicated that their ride was inbound. Thou whistled Mango back to him, clip clipped on her leash. But, said Light, I intend to find out. And then I intend to make use of it. Okay. And now another Dr. Clef story. A cold fury descended upon her and settled just below her heart. I wonder who that's about. That's not very long. On Monday morning, Dr. Alto Clef, formerly a Director of Training and Development, and now the Director of Mobile Task Force Lambda 2, Dr. Clef's bisexual stripper assassin squad, walked into the suite of rooms set aside for said mobile task force and waved pleasantly to the attractive woman with vaguely Asian features sitting behind one of the six desks in the outer suite, the other five of which were empty. Special Senior Agent Andrea S. Adams did not reply. This did not surprise Dr. Clef. He headed to his own office, closed the door behind him, and turned on his computer. He two-finger typed his password into the keyboard and began going through the day's emails and alerts. After reading the first couple of messages, he realized something was odd. He scanned his computer screen carefully. His eyes lit upon the header of his emails. That was how Dr. Clef found out that he was now the director of Mobile Task Force Lambda 2 and pending sexual harassment complaint. His head snapped up. He glared out of the window of his office at the lone occupant of the outer office. Adam's eyes were locked onto her computer screen and her face was expressionless, except for a slight hint of an amused smile around her lips. Dr. Excuse me, Clef's left eyelid twitched once. On Tuesday morning, Special Agent Andrea Adams walked into the suite of rooms set aside for Mobile for Task Force Lambda 2 impending sexual harassment complaint and found that her stationery had arrived. A nameplate, box of notepads, and a stack of 500 contact cards, which were like business cards for people in the same business as you are, were sitting on her desk. She picked up one of the contact cards and looked it over. Very nice, she thought. Cream colored. Embossed with the Foundation logo. There's my name and the Mobile Task Force symbol and the name of the... She glared intently at the name of the Mobile Task Force. Senior Special Agent Andrea Adams, Executive Officer Mobile Task Force Lambda 2, uppity smart mouth bitch. She crushed the card in her hand reflexively as she heard Clef snicker in his office. A cold fury depended upon her, descended upon her and settled just below her heart. On Wednesday morning, Dr. Alto Clef, Director of Mobile Task Force at Lambda 2, uppity smart mouth bitch, headed down to the site cafeteria to pick up some snacks and bottled water for his office mini fridge. He filled out the necessary form and slid his ID card into the computer as the bearded man behind the cash register gathered up the requested supplies. The bearded man stared at the computer screen, glared at Clef, and asked, Is this a fucking joke? Oh god, not again. The bearded man turned the screen around, revealing that Clef had ch charged the snacks and drinks to the operating account of Mobile Task Force Lambda 2, fat, ugly, misogynist dinosaur. Clef let out a single, loud, sharp, extremely heartfelt curse. 
On Thursday morning, Clef smirked as he walked into the office, eagerly awaiting Adam's reaction when she found out what he had changed the name of Mobile Task Force to. He powered up his computer and looked up at the top screen. His eyes widened. He, he stood up from his desk and stormed out of the office, down the hall, down two flights of stairs, and down another hall to a red door with the symbol of Record Keeping and Information Security Administration. He opened the door, read, ready to let out a loud, angry complaint, only to halt dead in his tracks as he saw two women there he wasn't expecting to see. One of them was Adam, standing in front of the desk clutching a request for minor services fr form, the same one he'd filled twice this week, requesting change to nickname of Mobile Task Force, looking shamefaced and guilty. The other was a severe-looking woman appearing on the teleconference screen behind the hapless tech usually assigned to this desk. Ah, very good, you've arrived, Maria Jones, director of the Foundation Record Keeping and Information Security Administration, said coldly. Now that the entirety of Mobile Task Force Lambda 2, adults acting like children, are here, I'm going to begin my little talk about wasting my valuable employees' time with stupid office pranks and juvenile games. <laughs> On Friday morning, Adams and Clef went to the armory to get a gun. Alright, love, the balding man with the winked dagger tattoo on his bulging right bicep said. That's one MK sidearm, serial number A5965200, one shoulder holster, three magazines, and 100 rounds of 9mm parabellum ammunition. Anything else? No, Adams said curtly. Cool! In that case, you sign here, and you, Dr. Clef, sign as Task Force Commander. Clef and Adams complied in silence. Alright then, the balding man said. If you just hand me your ID cards, I'll put this into inventory. Clef and Adams handed over their ID cards in silence. <laughs> the balding man whistled a cheerful tune as he swiped the cards, then his brow furrowed in confusion. He checked and rechecked the data on the screen. Hey, seems there's an error in the system. I'm getting your unit designation, but not your unit's nickname. That's alright, Clef said shortly. Yeah, no big deal, it happens all the time with new mobile task forces. The armorer said, if you know your unit's nickname, I can enter it in for you. No, said Clef and Adams, director and executive officer of mobile task force Lambda 2 no name entered, respectively. Okay, so that was just a silly one. Now let's see how long just the formality is. Dr. Daniel A. Slinger envied his peers outside of the Foundation. They only had to deal with life in the 21st century eroding mankind's sanity, and he supposed that was enough to deal with as it was. Even without anomalies running amok in the world, human beings were quite capable of messing up their minds without any outside help. Mix in the trauma inherent in realizing reality was a sham, and what did you get? One hell of a challenge for people like Ace Linger. He put down his briefcase in his spare office they had assigned him at Site 103 and rubbed his eyes. He'd been awake for the entire flight over here, his body once again refusing to catch the sleep he so desperately needed. It was all—it always did that on long flights, stubbornly refusing to give in to exhaustion. And when he did doze off, he'd be awoken by a cough or someone talking. It was infuriating, but he refused to medicate himself for something like this. He saved pharmaceuticals for when it really mattered. Coffee, he muttered and went back out to get some from one of the machines in the hall. When he came back, someone was sitting in the office chair opposite the desk. He was in his mid-forties, impeccably dressed in what looked like an expensive dark suit. He looked like he meant business, and not the, do you sometimes find yourself in a bind because you don't have enough containers for your leftovers, ma'am, kind of business. Dr. Aislinger, welcome! Aislinger hurriedly put the paper cup down in a nearby filing cabinet and shook hands. Thank you, and you are? My name is Dr. Manuel Cutler, and I'm a member of Foundation's, the Foundation's Ethics Committee. Perhaps you've heard of us. Aislinger held a straight face and then curtly nodded. Who hasn't, Dr. Cutler? The shadowy puppet masters of the Foundation. Those who ultimately control all things in this organization. From the procedures and guidelines we use to the quality and strength of the coffee-flavored water I just got for myself, so to speak. Cutler raised an eyebrow, but Aislinger couldn't determine whether it was because he was puzzled or amused. Perhaps both. Well, this is certainly one way of looking at it. But no, they don't control everything. In fact, we prefer that the Foundation regulate itself as much as possible. However, there are some times when we need to assert some control. This is one of them. Now it was Daniel's turn to raise his eyebrow ever so slightly. Oh? And is this when you tell... And is this then where you fill me in on the reason why I'm here? He walked over to the chair behind the desk and sat down. Motioning at the other office chair, he said, Please, sit down. Color took his seat again and smiled. Thank you. And yes, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Or that is exactly what I'm going to do. See, while you were here to do a psychological evaluation of certain members of staff here at Site 103, I'm afraid the plural has become singular. Singular? Aislinger said and took a sip of his coffee. Ow! 
He exclaimed and hurriedly put the cup down again. I keep forgetting these machines serve the stuff piping hot at one side and lukewarm at others. Damn it! Cutler waited patiently until Eislinger had finished fussing with his coffee cup. Yes, we're flying in Tennyson tomorrow. He'll be taking the personnel you were scheduled to see. You, on the other hand, will get to concentrate on one individual. Oh? Eislinger perked up. This reeked of a challenge. Who is it? He must either be a wreck or very important to you. Cutler folded his hands on his knees and smiled. It was not unlike seeing a shark bare its teeth. What apt characterizations, Dr. Eislinger. Perhaps he's both. Regardless, you'll be meeting him in... Approximately 44 minutes. Daniel sighed. A challenge it might be, but it was also, once again, a change of plans. He wasn't good with changing plans. It meant actively working at staying alert, keeping his mind focused to deal with it. Even now, he could feel his brain racing to recalculate how the day would go, like a car's navigation system frantically trying to get him back on the highway after he'd taken a detour through Weirsville, USA, or Philadelphia. <laughs> Famous for its three-headed cows and spontaneously combusting chick. He shook his head to clear it. Cutler was watching him with a faint air of amusement that instantly and firmly assigned him a bunk bed in Acelinger's camp do not like. So, might I be allowed to know who I'm going to be evaluating then, he ventured, trying to inject some sense of antagonism into his voice. But of course, Dr. Acelinger, I'm sure that would be the very minimum courtesy you deserve. There was an uncomfortable silence. And the winner is? Da Daniel ventured, now actually annoyed. We call him Bill. So that's not his real name. Does it matter? It does to me, Dr. Cutler. Someone's name does have some power, you know. <laughs> I suppose it would to a psychologist. Bill will do for now, Dr. Eslinger. Remember what happened to that cat? What happened to the cat? The cat? What cat? Am I missing something? It would seem so. Curiosity killed the cat? Oh, a proverb. Sorry, sometimes these things go right over my head. Yes, apparently. <clears throat> Well, I won't keep you any longer. I suppose you'll want to do some prep. You'll find most of what you need to know in the email you just received. I don't have any new. Bing! Break a leg, Daniel! Cutler said smugly and walked to the door. He stopped when Aislinger called after him. You know, Dr. Cutler, if you're going to pretend you're on ethics committee, please try to keep your pronouns straight. Cutler turned back to Aislinger. Sorry? You said they don't rule everything. I can't remember... I can't say I met a member of the O5 Council before, but I, I can say I don't really like the way you, you people do things. And what makes you assume I have anything to do with the council and didn't just innocently use the wrong pronoun, the Perry King? No one on the Foundation's payroll could afford a Brioni suit unless they owned said payroll. Try blending in a little more next time, but then, with your latent narcissism, that's going to be hard, isn't it? Touché, Dr. Aislinger. You're as observant as they assured me you would be. Try to put that to good use, will you? You'd be doing us a favor. He reached behind him for the door and nodded. Then he was gone. Daniel Horatio Acelinger desperately longed for a clean shirt. He also considered a dose of amnestics and a job at a small town psychologist in Alaska. The Bears were undoubtedly better company than his colleagues. Can you imagine a psychologist helping a bear? That'd be just interesting. Okay, so that was the formality. Integrity project. <laughs> okay. The director of Site 81 was far away from the confines of the Foundation, and a cottage nestled in the Rockies. He sat on the back porch, enjoyed the brisk morning air, took a deep breath, and then another, and smiled as he considered how much more pleasant breathing was here in the long corridors, or then in the long corridors and dark rooms below the lake. He loved Site 81, there was no doubt there, but Site 81 was old, built seemingly eons ago. It was an incredible place to do research and to contain anomalous entities, but it gave no consideration to comfort. All of that, though, was in the distance of his mind. The doctor sipped a, from a cup of coffee and idly played with the IV in his arm. Oh. Carlyle was reading a book gifted to him by an old friend, one now long retired from the Foundation. They had met when they were young men come together when they were forced to dissolve their connections with the outside world. Once, they might have said they loved each other in their own way. When the time came for the other man to leave the Foundation, he had given Carlyle the book and a promise. For them to meet up after Actus finally retired and moved to Italy together. They'd always loved Italy. Carlyle had smiled, taken the book, and made the promise. But who knows, Carlyle, Oliver had said. Maybe you'll be here forever, grinding away in that lab until the sun goes out. Lord knows you haven't aged in nearly 30 years. Carlyle had laughed and told his friend to wait for him. After Oliver Wrights had left the Foundation, he moved to Minneapolis, where he was born. 
He died one night, 23 years later, when a power outage from a snowstorm darkened his home and he froze next to an empty wood stove. He was 87 years old. That same night, Carlisle approved an order to upgrade a dangerous SCP to, to the Keter class, with restrictions. He did not hear about Oliver's passing until later. He had not thought of it since until he grabbed this book on the way out of town. His eyes had hung on the handwritten inscription just inside the cover. To my dearest friend with love, he read the book. He continued reading it well, well into the late morning when he began considering lunch. He stood up, walking slowly and carefully towards the doorway and entered. He left the book on the table next to his chair outside. The old doctor stretched briefly and then began to make a sandwich. Turkey on rye standard fare back at work. Old habits die hard, but here at least he could offer himself a slice of cheddar to go with it. His hand reached for the refrigerator and stopped when he noticed the man standing in the corner of his room. Ha! Ah, Carlisle said as he slowly pulled the refrigerator open. So good of you to join me. Early though, for me to be going back. It's only been two days, I feel. The man stood quietly, unmoving. Carlisle glanced around as he closed the door, realizing then that there were many other men and women in his cottage pressed up against the walls. Some wore suits, others plain clothes, some carried weapons. They all stood silent, staring straight ahead. The old man shook his head and laughed. The formalities are unnecessary, I think. There are none here but you and me and you. They all left the room then, save for one. Ah, there we go. Carlisle moved into the living room and sat down on a plush sofa. His IV was still in his arm, connected to a bag that hung on a metal rack and followed him wherever he went. It rolled across the hardwood and sat next to him when he did, quietly watching the whole scene. Come and have a seat, Joshua. I'm sure this is not going to be quick. The man slid effortlessly across the room silently. He moved towards a chair and then was seated in it. His eyes pressed on Carlisle from across the room. The old doctor continued to eat his sandwich. So, he said in between bites, what is somebody like you doing all the way out here with somebody like me? And with an entourage, no less. He licked his lips carefully. They cannot send somebody who is less of a big fish for an old man like Actus, he laughed. The other man did not move. I'm not here for who you are, I'm here for who you were. Carlisle paused long enough to swallow and then continued into his meal. All that is Joshua is another way of saying that I'm not the man who I used to be. You know it and these old bones know it. Took another bite. I think you'll have better luck somewhere else, friend. The uncomfortable silence was broken by the sound of a bird chirping outside. Carlisle thought to look towards the sound but knew better than to take the man out of his sight. It is not the youth of that man I'm looking for, Jean, the man said, nor his aptitude with a weapon. Carlisle shrugged, the hairs on the back of his neck rising. Then why are you here? You know. Humor me, I'm very old. The other man stood. Twenty-five entities contained within two years. Extensive knowledge of behaviors and anomalous traits of many more. Ability to manipulate situations concerning anomalous entities in order to facilitate containment. Understanding of the... Potential of entities. The reason you joined the classification committee. The reason they made you its head. The reason Site 81 has gone without breach in your tenure there. Carlisle nodded and snapped up the final piece of his sandwich. These things you say, they are true. I will not deny facts, and yet I am an old man, Joshua. Certainly my edges have worn dull. Certainly they are looking for one other than myself. They are not. And if I refuse, I am content in my work. I enjoy what I do. I have put those things behind me, Joshua. I am a man of science, as I always have been. Or have always been. What if I do not want to abandon that as well? This is an old debt, Jean. Jean, whatever. It is one you knew would come due in time. The years have gone by and age has overtaken all but a select few. Illness has ruined many, and yet some persist. Have you forgotten why that is? Carlisle darkened. No, I have not forgotten. Joshua moved towards the door. Then I will alert the council to your decision. Unfortunately, this is the end of your vacation. Your treatment can continue at our secure facility. You think an old man is a flight risk? No, Joshua said. I think you are. A handful of agents appeared then, gathering up Carlisle's belongings and moving them outside. The doctor was shuffled from the living room to the front door and escorted to the waiting vehicle. As he went to step inside, he stopped and turned to face Joshua. Is it worth it? Who can say? Joshua said, closing the door after him. In the face of mountains, you are only a man, Jean. John. John, 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 John. You can decide for yourself when it is over. The, the car moved away from the cottage and began its long trek down the mountain. Joshua stayed a moment more, long enough to do a last search through the cottage, and then he too was gone. An open book lay on the table on the back porch, unnoticed. A token of love between two who had once dared to dream about a life together. The dreams had become broken and the memories lost, but the book had remained a testament to what is required. That night, it rained. 
The door to the containment cell slid open slowly, and a woman entered first. Zena knew this one, her, her doctor, the one who talked to her when she was sad. She did not recognize the man behind her, the one in the white coat with the dark glasses and shiny head. He smiled at her, and she smiled back. He didn't look that scary. Zena, her doctor said, this is Dr. Atkus. He's here to ask you some questions, and then we're going to have you do some stuff, okay? The little girl nodded and sat upright. Dr. Jora moved to the corner of the room, and Dr. Actus stepped forward and sat down on a chair in front of Xena. He extended his hand, and she shook it. Hello, Xena. My name is Carlisle. He smiled at her again. You may call me whatever you want. Xena thought on it, then perked up. Can I call you? I can call you Carl? Carlisle laughed. Carl is just fine. He pulled a red ball from his coat pocket and held it in front of Xena. Xena, Dr. Winsley tells me you are very special. I think that is very interesting, and I'm curious to know how special you are. He tossed the ball and caught it. Can you make this ball blue? He handed Xena the ball. The little girl took it, looked at it intently, shook it a few times, and then drooped. I can't really do anything unless I'm told. Carlisle nodded. That's quite alright, Xena. Please make this ball blue. The little girl's eyes twitched slightly, and she squeezed the ball in her hand. When she let go of it, it was purple. She coughed and then gave it to Atkins, eyes downcast. Carlisle smiled. No need to be ashamed, my dear, he said, taking the ball. You did wonderfully. She looked up. But it isn't blue. The doctor cocked his head. Is it not? It looks plenty blue to me. You see, different worlds, they have different meanings depending on where you're from. For me, I see blue here. My people would call this blue. Zena squinted. I... This is blue? Carlisle nodded. As sure as my name is Dr. Actus. Or Actus. Now, make this blue ball purple for me. Zena stared at the ball again and then squeezed it. When she let it go, it was green. She looked up at Carlisle inquisitively. The old man smiled. Good, Zena, he said, nodding slowly. Very good. Yeah, I have no idea what was going on with that. It sounds like uh, Dr. Ac uh, Actus might be some form of alien. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do uh, Boss of Me, and then I'll do new tricks in the next episode. Hmm. SCP-1837 Containment Area, Site like 77. Dr. Shirley Gillespie, uh, Gil I think it's Gillespie, 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 was doing her daily rounds when she noticed something curious. In a clear plastic tank where there was usually an old-fashioned janitor's mop floating in the gentle current, there was instead a hot slice of nothing. This was a problem since Director Gillespie was not aware of any reason for this mystical mop to be absent. She pursed her lips slightly. Her entourage knew what that meant. Security Director Anderson was the first to speak up. Ah... Uh, I apologize for not informing you sooner, Director. That object has been requisitioned for observation. Because we didn't look at it. Oh, really? I wasn't aware that I had authorized any such testing. You haven't. The orders came from higher up, need to know basis and all. Because we shot him a glare. Anderson, I expect a better explanation than that. These, whoever they are, come into my site like they own it, and you don't tell me a thing? Well, interjected her grandson, Ralph Roget, to the relief of everybody else in the room. Perhaps it's not so bad, Director. Perhaps somebody from Overwatch is taking notice of our work. After all, how else, uh, our great security director not have time to inform you before our rounds? Gillespie nodded and took off down the hall at a brisk pace. Anderson, where are the observations being held? Site 77 Euclid Testing Wing. Director Gillespie made her way to the back row of the observation booth as quietly and inconspicuously as she and 15 other people could. They needn't have worried about the interlopers being alerted to their presence. The men up front were completely focused on the testing chamber below. Director Carlisle was the centerpiece of the group, observing the testing while the others took notes. He was a lanky man with dark glasses that accentuated his shiny chrome dome. His hands were the only ones in the group that weren't busy, instead they were folded up behind his back. For another half hour, men scribbled down on clipboards and continued videotaping and other assorted things you do when documenting anomalous activity. When the lights came on, Carlisle was the first to turn around and was just as surprised as everyone else to see that they were not alone anymore. He was the only one to know who he was surprised to see, though. Gillespie matched the dossier description he'd been given. A small, older woman, permed and dressed in a simple white shirt and shorts, innocuous at first and second glance. She hardly struck the impression of a woman who could control an entire site. But here she was, surrounded by titanic stone-faced men, and one young man by her side. Dr. Gillespie, I presume? Gillespie stood up, holding her purse in both hands. Yes. She moved to the stairs, descending towards a gathering of observers. You seem to know my name, sir, but I don't think we've had the pleasure of being formally introduced. 
Carlyle stuck his hand out at a stiffly a stiff 80 degree angle. Director Carlyle Actus, I apologize for the intrusion, Director, and for the unannounced arrival, but we've come on, we had to come on a need to know basis, you see, and I don't need to know. Gillsby smiled at him. I see. Whatever you and your boys are doing here must be terribly important. Yes, very important. I've heard a lot about your work here, Director. Carlisle tried to do a passable impression of a casual smile. Gillespie imitated it. I am so glad my work is known outside our little domain. She turned around and motioned towards Dr. Rajette. Ralph, come meet the man from Overwatch. I never s Carl started Carlisle, but he was interrupted by a bounding young man coming within a few inches of him. Dr. Rajette grinned and stuck out his hand. Hi, I'm Ralph. Charmed. Carlisle shook his hand, his eyes still on Director Gillespie. You are the esteemed director's grandson, are you not? Yep. He grinned like a wicked child. I've heard a lot about you, Doctor. Carlisle frowned quietly. What? Oh, um, well, maybe if you mess the director for tea, she can tell you all about it. Carlisle broke off the handshake and folded his hands behind his back. That would be desirable if your director would have me. Gillespie grinned. Despite the difference in the way the two presented themselves, Actus saw the family resemblance. Of course, we can seat you in the tea room as soon as you're ready. Ralph retreated to her side and she whispered in his ear. They ascended up the stairs and their entourage followed. Carlisle watched them both as they went. Tea time! Director Gillespie sipped her tea. It's going to get cold if you just leave it there, Mr. Actus. I'm well aware, Carlisle said, sifting his seat. I'm just not fond of burning my tongue. An odd aversion to risk for someone in your line of work, Gillespie said, closing her eyes as she sat down her teacup, which is... That's not something I'm at liberty to discuss. I see. Gillespie began absentmindedly stirring sugar into her tea. Now, do you think this mysterious work is a part of a larger scheme of for our commanders, or do you do it out of the kindness of your heart? We are reactivating old projects, that's all I can say. Ones that involve acid. Are you using them for containment, control, or something else? I did not say any of that, Carlisle frowned as he picked up his teacup. I would appreciate it if you did not make assumptions about my work. But you won't tell me anything. Conversation is a two-way street. That's something I learned from Ralph. Whenever he was mad or pouting, I'd talk at him until he was ready to talk back. I would hope you would not be so prying into a young man's life. Carlisle sipped his tea and found it bitter. Gillespie smiled at him. Of course. Enjoying your tea? Yes, thank you. Gillespie sipped her tea. So, since you've come all the way around the world to meet us, I assume you know something about our fair Site 77. Sadly, I'm ignorant. Carlisle peered into his tea. Are you going to elaborate for me? Well, perhaps you'd like to return to our former avenue of discussion. Before Gillespie could respond, Anderson came into the room and placed biscuits on the table. Gillespie waited until she heard the door shut before she continued. Site 77 has been here in this lovely Italian country since before the Second World War. I wasn't even aware of the foundation then. My family and I lived in West Virginia in Huntington where my father ran a grocery store. Carlisle muttered something that sounded like fascinating. During the war, the site was bombed, which caused a major, major containment breach. A lot of people died. Isn't it terrible how things can cascade like that? What do you mean? Carlisle asked as he reached for a biscuit. Bombs have fallen because of what we kept here. There was so much terrible bloodshed. An awful thing when anomalies can run rampant like that. Well, Carlisle started, crumbs popping out of his mouth like shrapnel. <laughs> Before he could continue, Gillespie cut him off. Don't talk with your mouth full. Annoyed, Carlisle sw swallowed. Well, that is only because we lost control. That is the real tragedy. If we had any anomalous countermeasures to stop the bombers from even getting that close, it would have been another story. Does that count as defending the weaponization of anomalous objects? I did not say that, but you're not denying it. Carlisle huffed. I do not appreciate being badgered like this. You're not being very hospitable, Miss Gillespie. Director, please. Gillespie took a biscuit and leaned back in her chair. Don't worry, I'm not here to lecture you about how we learned about that in the good old days. I'm not... I want to tell you about what I want that I want to help. Beg your pardon? This is my field of interest, pushing my objects to places nobody would expect. Why do you think I hoard them? Them? Please take a step back, Director. I'm in no position to offer me a job. I know. But you must have a lot of pull to be able to just drop in whenever, you, wherever you please. Maybe you could let the powers that be know that Shirley is ready for another job. Site 77 Administrative Apartments. As Dr. Rajette helped his grandmother pack, he couldn't help but help himself but to worry about her. Are you sure you want to leave me in charge? Anderson will be more than happy to take over, I'm sure. Gillespie smiled at him as she packed her toiletries. You'll do fine. Anderson isn't half as qualified as you are. Besides, I can't trust him to stand up for everybody like you would. Ralph smiled. How long do you think you'll be gone for? I don't know. But you'll be able to keep things together for me while I'm gone, I'm sure. 
don't worry about things. Are you ready to go? Gillsby snapped her suitcase shut. I am. Okay, so. This is definitely the part where they're gathering up people to uh, do the thing. Rajet wrote boss of me. So we got new tricks, walls of the door, da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. and part two is when we hit harm's way. I'll probably try to reach that in the next episode when I have more time to do it. But in the meantime, this has been Anachi Sasuke. This was episode, I believe, 29 of Let's Read the SCP Foundation Wiki. And I will see you guys in the next one. Later.